Judith, we're talking about private and public, the yeah. parts of us. We're talking about Edward Snowden. Yes. We're talking about characters in your writing. Let's go into that theme, as it were, because you write very privately, it seems, both from yourself and the characters you write. You go into a privacy of those characters. A lot of other writers don't. Yes, it's an interesting disjunction because when I teach playwriting or mentor playwrights, I always say, be, of course, begin with what you know. And your story of what happened to your aunt in Fergus, Ontario is, is every bit as fascinating as Tolstoy or, or, or anything. And, and absolutely it is. And it's those details that are rich. And when they move away from that, they often aren't writing well anymore. On the other hand, I've actually never written autobiographically. In the sense, in the in the sense of a bio, biography, a, li a life, right. and what's in a life. On the other hand, my blood is all over the page at the same time, and I make that leap to characters like Lindy England or Nerdisel Safar or or Sandy, uh, you know, any of them that I tell young writers not to. But then I think I'm drawing like an actor. And I am an actor as well, so I'm drawing from a, a place that is all myself and my emotional experience and expanding it and along with research, and I have to channel them. I have to be in them. But it, it is a funny kind what of gap your, there. The, your blood is all over the page. I mean, that if, if, if the raw, if, if I'm, what's frightening is that if I'm playing Lindy England, the, who just to remind people is the young soldier who was convicted of abusing Iraqi detainees at Abu Ghraib. Uh, the soldier in the pictures with yeah, the Yeah, with a thumb the, up. She's yeah. 21. And, and I was just intrigued by who was she? What, where did she come from? And so I started doing a little research. And what, the posts I saw by accident, because I actually didn't know how to navigate the internet at all, but I somehow came upon them. They were so filthy. They were so violent, and they were actually nothing, not really in support of the Iraqi detainees at all. It was nothing to do with that. It was all because she was what they deemed a homely woman. And they hated her for that. So the playwright in me, the woman in me, all of it, that's what I glommed onto. I thought, okay, she had no currency. So not only was she poor from a uh, sub-welfare trailer park in Virginia, but she wasn't deemed the only way a woman can get out of that situation is by being attractive. And she didn't have that either. So her life was to please her mess. She got a boyfriend in the army. So any, any kind of moral qualms went right out the window because it was survival for her. And it's not to let her off the hook either. So I had to kind of just go down, down that route of, of, of denial. Of her denying herself? Her denying any moral qualms. So when you kick around someone or set the dogs on them, put a bag over their head, what do you cut off? I just think it's our strongest muscle. I mean, any time there's blood on our plate, we're using the muscle of denial if we care about animals, of course, and s step over the homeless people in, in winter. So I sort of try to go to that place. So it's very, because I have to dig deep. I, I'm a person who fights against that denial all the time, but it's there, of course. Uh, so, so let me ask a ridiculous question, because some writers would go there intellectually, or some writers would go there politically, but you go there, as you say, with your blood. I try to, yeah. How, how do you do that? What is that? Well, it's the same way you do as an actor. I go as an actor. And, and I start by getting the voice. And, uh, you know, it's good and bad for an actor. I'm, I, I'm a fairly good mimic. So that's kind of a bad thing because you can stay on the surface. But it's a good thing because it opens the door for me. So I can get the voice, so listening to her a few times, and then try to dive deeper. She has one moment of conscience in her monologue where she just she's haunted by something he said uh, something like I will not do this for your entertainment and she's like stupid stupid that he said that but, you know I wake up sometimes because I didn't want to sentimentalize apparently it takes 80 years before even you know to people who've done the most terrible committed the most terrible murders will even acknowledge any response any guilt any I thought that was pretty interesting talk to me a bit about your phrase the muscle of denial I think that's what I work to lift as a, as a theater artist. That's our mandate, I think. Because the only way we can survive, of course, is by employing this denial uh, rigorously every day. As I said, stepping over homeless people, eating animals, knowing that children are starving and they're just a little plane ride away. And, and denial and, that we're going to die and in we're gonna die. 10, 20, 30 years Abs or whatever it is. Yeah, so now, now it's getting closer. <laughs> Absolute denial, yes, and that's the basic one. 
Um, but I think to awaken that wonderful title, which, which play When We Dead Awaken, it's a great title because that's how I approach the audience. And me dead first, I have to awaken myself in the writing and then thereby awaken the actor and the actor awakens the audience as well. And so when we have a moment that our denial is lifted, that moment that we, oh, we all have those from time to time in our lives and don't you think our lives transform? I realized I was full of fear uh, all the time and someone said, and it was only a little while ago, the word fearless, it changed everything for me. So even at age 59, I'm shifting and it's those moments of change that I look for. And the moment, it, can the audience lift the denial and then walk out and something will change? Some don't, some won't, they hang on, just like that.